Oh, well, Adam, I can talk. I can tell you about uh, you know developing the quals. You know the targetry. It's kind of sad, but targetry drives a lot of what what we do. Uh, right now, the big headache is steel targets, and everyone's weirded out about shooting at steel targets, even though the closest steel target we shoot, well, they shoot at sniper school, is somewhere around 265 meters away. You know the minute of man idea of that we're shooting these 20 by 40 iron maidens it it pumps you up pretty well when you're when you're in school and you think you're doing really well until you get out and all of a sudden now you have to shoot a target that's much smaller uh you have to shoot you know the size of a helmet which is maybe you know 10 inches across at 500 is much harder than shooting a 20 by 40 iron maiden and thinking you're good so we try to develop the scenarios, uh, but at the schoolhouse, you're greatly restricted by what you have to get through the school. Uh, the amount of people you have to get through the school, you know, commanders won't send people to come to school for them to fail and go home. You know, when I went to school back in the dark ages, you know, we had muskets, stuff like that. We had muskets. Actually, I had a, an M24 that stayed in the hard case did not get taken out until you got to the range another nat you did all stocks with an m21 so in 90, 1993 we did stocks with the m21 we shot the m24 unwrapped it wiped it down make it look pretty no painting of the guns pow shoot your rounds put it back in the case fold it up make it look nice put it back on the truck. That's great. But eight guys out of my class of 36 passed. That was acceptable for the army back in the nineties. You know, it wasn't a big deal today. If you have a class of 36 or 40 and you pass eight, uh, you're probably going to have a bunch of people come down from, senior up, up, up top and want to know why you're failing so many people. You know, commanders are paying big money for this guy to be gone for seven weeks for him to fail. So standards got changed. And so instead of doing two tests and you're gone, you do a test, a retest, a retrain, and then a, and then a, a follow on test again to make sure you get every opportunity to pass. Does that make better shooters? Maybe, but it does make for us to have to change the standards to make sure we can put more throughput. Uh, shooting at night, we went from shooting qualification all the way back to 700 to uh, move that back to 500. You know, it changes based on the command and based on what the commanders are willing to agree with. So that that's part of the issue is we'd love to be able to change everything and make it as hard as we could. But the reality is uh, you're an institution that's not allowed to do that. You have to get throughput. You have to get people out there. Yeah, I guess the idea is they'll get better when they get to their unit. But unfortunately, since we don't have a sustainment program for the Army, uh, about how we keep our snipers squared away and, and, and well-trained and, and keep them going. I mean, sniper is one of the few schools in the military where when you graduate, the your company commander, battalion commander, everybody thinks you have a this certain level of expertise that you are just, I mean, you can hit anything, anything within three, you know, Within anything within, say, 900 meters, you should be able to engage, whether it's a man, a, a hand, whatever it is, whatever you see, you should be able to engage it. When you come out of the schoolhouse, you feel like that. You're probably shooting the best you're ever going to shoot because you're never going to get, you know, all the rounds you want to shoot every single day. You never see, you'll never see that again. You're going to go back to your unit and you're going to get, uh, what's the strack, Rick? I think we talked about the strack. What's the strack? I think it's like for one sniper per year, I think it's under 200 rounds, if I remember yeah, exactly. 
for like the the new uh, uh, Alpha One Ninety One. Uh, I I want to say it was like yeah, two the less than three hundred total a year. Um, yeah, total a year. Alpha Alpha Eleven look, is a little bit more. Uh, I want to say you're closer to like six hundred a year, something like that. I, I, no, I, I don't think it's that much. I, I forgot how no, it's not. It's, it's, yeah, it's not very much. Uh, yeah. If you if I would go ahead. No, I was. I, I look. I've been looking at the numbers like section wide for a while now, and I, I, I forgot exactly what it breaks down to. Uh, Ten dudes, including myself, you know. So, I, yeah, I'm sure it's it's less than six hundred a year. I'd I'd be curious to see. Uh, you know, the the Mich- was it the Michigan National Guard guys who won the uh, the international sniper comp. Yep. I'd be really curious to see the the comparisons between. The, the top 10 teams and the amount of ammunition expended or say the top 20. So you get a bigger data set, the amount of rounds expended to get to them to that point. <laughs> oh, you mean the amount of rounds and the amount of months. Yeah. Exactly. Training, but and the amount of months that. training at Fort Benning to yeah. be able to shoot at, at the level they're shooting at. Yeah. I mean, I, I talked to the guys, uh, from the group guys, I talked. I was talking to Rudy, and he came down and shot it without really doing much of a train up. You know, just doing his normal stuff. But he's an old group guy that's been shooting for a long time, and he shoots as a civilian as well. And since he's a National Guard guy, he gets to shoot a lot more as a civilian. Those the guys who won this year did a great job, but. It's not like they walked off the street in their street clothes one day. They were walking down the street as National Guard dude, hopped on a plane, flew down to Fort Benning, pulled some rifles out of a closet somewhere, and shot. No, that's a, that's a misconception that people have of the National Guard guys who compete at these things. If you have a good unit, you will spend at least anywhere between three to nine weeks training in order to compete sniper comp period if you don't you're not gonna do very well that's just how it is you're not gonna yep. <laughs> no the, uh, I, I can tell you from firsthand experience um yeah the so the the international sniper comp it allots you know x amount of slots for guard teams and then the the word gets put out and uh so they start basically um not running tryouts, but they have a train up for it. And then the guys that eventually get selected to go represent said units, um, you know, they, they do a train up for it. And um, I think our, our guys, not last year, the year before, um, it, it, it was kind of a hanky deal, you know, boiled down to uh, funding for, uh, for some things. But, you know, it, it wasn't like, um, you know, Hey, here's here's the same amount of slots for the actual guys as the guard guys. Just send, you know, each section can send whoever they want. Now there, there's there's a little bit of a selection that goes on, a little bit of a train up, and uh, I don't want to say a little bit of a train up. There's good train up that goes on to it, which is a good thing. You know, nobody wants to go out there and, and you know fall on their faces and show their ass. And obviously, look at the Michigan guard guys. They, you know, they they show that it pays off. But um, yeah, it's it's a little bit different on that side of the house. Yeah, and then that wasn't specific to uh, to guard guys uh, or or active guys. I just wanted to see like if you took the the last year in aggregate and showed you know the amount of training they put towards that you know whether it be guard or active and actually act you know looked at the rounds expended and the 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 time it took to to get to that point, and then on top of that. Um, maybe do a little bit of uh looking as far as like their their what they trained on cuz that can be a, a you know you could you you could put together a really good training plan and then you get to the competition and you find that whatever you were training on is not quite what they you know had in mind yeah, it just it, it'd be an interesting look at you know the the 
what makes a proficient shooter. And that, and that would kind of be to the, the, you'd also have to compare that to each competition's actual, uh, you know, course of fire. So you could see exactly. whether the course of exactly. fire affected the, the training they did in retrospect, like they might actually be a very, very successful sniper team in terms of their actual duties, but the competition itself might've been a little bit different than what they normally trained on. Exactly. The, the competition may not have been their metal task, uh, may not attest to their metal tasks exactly uh, based on what their what their job is. It may have been more of, hey, maybe there's more small targets, maybe there's more movers, maybe there's more this or whatever it is. Uh, that's what I always thought where, you know, competition should be well-rounded. Uh, I would like the competition to be not be in the same spot every single year because then it gives home field advantage to guys who have years on Fort Benning. Uh, I mean, I can go to almost any range in Fort Benning and look at the range and within, you know, a couple of minutes of being on range, I can tell you where, where all the distances are because I spent nine years on Fort Benning. And when you spend nine years somewhere and a lot of the time you're in the field, you're going to, you're going to know the ranges real well. When you work at sniper school for two and a half years, you're going to know the ranges really well. When you see Burroughs range every single day for over a year and a half straight, you're going to know every single thing on that range. It doesn't matter if I come back today or I come back 10 years from now. Nothing's going to change on it. I mean, they made it even worse when they mowed everything down and took the, the chain file to it and made it all level. That was the worst thing they ever did. It may look like a bigger range now, it is a little bit, but they took all the contours out and they took all the vegetation out, all the trees out. The wind changes exactly the same way that it does on Coolidge, which is next door to it. So in, on Coolidge range, when you shoot to 50 cal, the wind blows either left or right, and it changes every day at, at lunchtime. That's it. Not, nothing new. So we have to we have to find a way to be able to test guys and make it semi-fair so everyone gets a fair shake. I'm glad the, Mich the Michigan National Guard guys did a great job this year. But like Matt was saying, how many rounds did they shoot? What kind of training program did they, did, did they do to get their proficiency level, proficiency level where it's at? Uh, then how many rounds did everybody else do? That would be an interesting correlation. Then how many guys would actually tell you the truth of how many rounds they got to shoot? 